In this lecture, we will learn about OJ electron spectroscopy. Here we say that OUGER, it is not pronounced as O auger, but it is pronounced as OJ, A U Z E Y. So, pronunciation is more like OJ electron spectroscopy, and as we, as we see that we utilize OJ electrons for the for achieving a particular spectrum. So, that is the reason we call it OJ electron spectroscopy. And uh, Auger electron spectroscopy, uh, the Auger effect was initially uh, observed by Pierre Auger, a French physicist in mid 1920s and this process has developed only in the late 1960s. And this particular process utilizes emission of low energy electrons which are generated by the Auger process. What is this Auger process? We will see, we will understand that later on. But it is a surface analytical technique for determining the composition of the surface layer. So, it is highly surface sensitive technique and that is what we will see in this particular lecture. So, this Auger electron, it was first discovered uh, by Pierre Auger on which this particular spectroscopic technique is named on and it was uh, later on developed only in 1960s which utilizes a low energy electron which is a Auger electron to achieve a chemical composition mainly of the surface. It is highly surface uh, sensitive technique. And once we initiate an electron beam, how does uh, this particular process uh, emerges? We will see initially the how the electron beam interacts with the material. So, we have this electron beam which comes and interacts with the material. So, there is there are certain interactions which are which keep occurring and it forms overall interaction is uh, contributes certain uh, region of the or the depth of a material. So, with certain uh, regimes which are which are more like this that we, we see only as very surface uh, uh, surface uh, depth of 0.5 to 5 nanometer which in which generates something called OJ electrons, OUGER OJ electrons and this is nothing but the incident beam which is striking onto the surface of a material and beneath the surface we will, we will have some interactions from the which it comes out as a secondary electron. Then we have some in, uh, elastically scattered electron with some regime of back scattered electrons then we have something which is corresponding to the regime of uh, interaction with the electron beam to produce X-rays and then this is regime of uh, primary electrons and this regime is coming out from the core level ionization. So, we see that the, OJ, the how the electron beam is interacting with the material, we see that the incident beam, uh, the incident beam actually which is uh, out here like this is the incident beam, it is interacting with the material and the surface layer generates OJ, OJ electrons and OJ electrons are characteristic within a certain regime of around 0.5 to 5, uh, 5 nanometers and beneath that we have uh, some electrons which are emerging which are called secondary electro electrons, these are again uh, inelastically scattered electrons and then we have uh, some elastic scattering with the material which result back scattered electrons. Uh, and in this particular lecture we, we are more interested in what is happening at the surface layer. So, we are mostly interested in the OJ process for this particular case and on the OJ analytical volume, it, it means how much uh, volume is being interacted when the electron beam is interacting with the material to generate some OJ electrons. So, we see that once the electron beam is uh, being incident onto the material, it is inter interacting only a very small amount which is corresponding to around 0 0.5 to 5 nanometer and this particular analytical volume, this is overall interaction volume. And then if we consider this is an electron beam which is uh, incidenting onto the material, only a very low level of volume maybe which is uh, limited to maybe a uh, couple of uh, nanometers, 5 to 10 nanometers is really interacting with the uh, material to result OJ electrons. And as we say that this is highly surface sensitive because all the uh, all the interactions they are uh, they are being uh, coming to the detect detector only within a surface uh, regime of 5 to 10 nanometer. It does not mean that the OJ electrons are not being generated in any other location. It just means that only the surface electrons, surface OJ electrons which are generated, they are able to escape the surface of the material or the sample to reach the detector. So, OJ electrons are being generated even inside the material once the beam is interacting with the material. So, we see in this particular process, uh, though electrons are, OJ electrons are being generated, that they do not acquire sufficient energy to come back to the, to leave the sample surface and that is what we see that the, elect, uh, the interaction volume is limited to around 5 to 10 of nanometers. So, basically that is what the characteristic of OJ electron is that OJ electrons fail to emerge 
with their characteristic energies if they are deeper than about 0.5 to 5 nanometer from the surface. So that is what is all about the OJ analytical volume. So we see how the beam is interacting with the material and the OJ electrons are being generated only from the surface. Though they are generated throughout the material like till where the electron beam is interacting with the material, all the OJ electrons cannot escape out. So that is what leads to the OJ analytical volume which is limited which makes it highly surface sensitive. And since it is highly surface sensitive and it is coming out from a very narrow regime, it basically has very high resolution and it can specially resolve chemical images which are approximately to the order of 100 angstroms or 10 nanometers. And additionally, OJ electron spectroscopy can also be utilized for performing depth profiling. And it, it uh, basically we remove the surface layers, uh, we see what is on the surface and we start uh, using, utilizing some ion etching we can start removing the surface layer and see what is beneath the material. So we can have the composition of the top surface and it might be an oxide of, of for a particular material. Then we start etching out using cert, uh, certain ion guns and then once we etch out the material, we see what is the uh, composition beneath that particular layer and that is called depth profiling and uh, Auger electron spectroscopy can be utilized to determine the underlying compositions. So that is what uh, so uh, nice about it. And it is a, a, one of the very essential evaluation tool in the microelectronic industry because we want to see what are the basic interconnects or what is, uh, is there any oxide forming on the surface or there are very certain uh, connectors or the gold coatings which are uh, basically plated onto uh, microelectronic devices. So uh, it, uh, my AES becomes a very essential tool in terms of analyzing or in terms of confirming whether the pro proper connection is achieved or what is the overall, uh, the, the surface very clean enough to have the conduction at particular level. So that is what it has become an essential tool and it is highly versatile and sensitive as it can detect up to 0.1 atom percent for a particular composition and th therefore it has become a standard analytical, analytical tool also in the research lab. So that tells its applicability of how OG electron spectroscopy can be utilized because it has very high resolution in terms of uh, 10 nanometers and then it can, it is highly sensitive in terms of uh, being able to detect up to 0.1 atom percent concentration for a particular sample and that is, that makes it very useful in research as well as uh, proper analysis of certain materials. And uh, though it is high, highly sensitive, it can detect up to one monolayer which is lying on the surface. So that tells its capability in terms of detecting uh, a particular composition which is even a single or a monolayer. And it can detect all the elements except hydrogen and helium. Why these things cannot be detected? We will come back as we uh, learn about the Auger process. It needs uh, a minimum of 3 electrons in the process, the Auger process. And since hydrogen and helium, they only have 1 and 2 electrons uh, in the outer shell, uh, it cannot really yield a Auger electron. And uh, since it is highly sensitive, it can also be used for monitoring the surface cleanliness of samples. Since the process is highly su uh, surface dependent, like uh, what is the overall su surface composition, it is highly surface sensitive. That is the reason we can also detect or monitor what is the cleanliness of a particular sample. And again, it can also do some quantitative compositional analysis of surface regimes by comparing, comparing it with some standard sample. So basically, we come to that it can detect even single monolayer. It can also monitor the overall surface cleanliness and also it becomes a essential tool in terms of quantitative composition and analysis only once when we have some standard sample also available for its comparison. And as we said earlier, the limitations extend to that it cannot detect hydrogen and helium just because the OJ process itself requires minim minimum of 3 electrons in its outermost shell. That is the reason hydrogen and helium are eliminated from the uh, from its detection. And at the same time, it will, will not provide a non-destructive depth profile. So if you want to see what is beneath the surface, we obviously need to cut it, we need to remove it. So that is the reason OJ electron, OJ electron spectroscopy, it can provide depth analysis only once the surface layers are removed. It is unlike that X-ray diffraction where X-ray can penetrate much more depth in, in, a couple, in many, many microns to be able to detect the information from the bulk. But AES, OJ electron spectroscopy cannot do that because it is highly surface sensitive. It can penetrate only a depth of around 5 to 10 nanometers, not more. And it also requires that samples be small and compatible with high vacuum. This is because that OJ electron, they, uh, they, they are very low energy electron 
and since if the electron has to come out of the surface it has to come out without any interaction it should be able to come out without any collisions with the atmospheric atoms if it is colliding with the atmospheric atoms it means it is losing the information and that is the reason that the samples they have to be compatible with the high vacuum and uh, uh, most of the time sometimes that non conducting samples also become a problem because we are always bombarding the sample with certain electrons and once you are bombarding the sample with the electrons that charge also has to be removed it has to be grounded if sample itself is non conducting in nature basically the charge is not going away it is not getting earthed so for this particular oj electron spectroscopy we need the sample to be conductive and because to avoid any charge development on the surface so in this particular case the non conducting samples they develop charge and it becomes impossible to really analyze them because of the electron beam bombardment so that is a particular one more limitation of it that hydrogen helium cannot be detected it cannot provide non uh, non destructive depth analysis depth profile and it requires the sample be compatible to that of for high vacuum uh, it, it becomes a little bit problem in uh, certain biological samples or polymer samples where the samples themselves cannot take much of vacuum as they start as they might start decomposing so this is one of the very major limitations that it cannot be uh, used for detecting certain biological samples so uh, and again it also cannot have uh, it cannot take the non conducting samples as well so that makes its certain limitations of the oj electron spectroscopy and once the uh, inter um, the electrons are interacting with the matter so the basically the excited electrons it can return to its low energy state because if sample is interacting with the uh, if an uh, with an electron beam uh, it can uh, excite the electron and ex the excited electron can come back or it can relax in certain dif different processes so there are two competing processes one is that that the electron will simply return to the core level state so once we have excited electron it has gone out one electron is knocked out uh, from the core shell and then one uh, electron will come back to uh, to its uh, core and core level state which was uh, earlier knocked off and the difference in energy will yield to some x ray fluorescence so we had certain knocked off electron that knocked off electron core shell is being occupied by a electron from a higher energy shell and that basically the difference in energy is left as a x ray fluorescence or secondly it can also happen that the uh, when the knocked off shell is it's gone off when knocked uh, electron is knocked off one electron can jump from higher energy to a lower energy state or from a higher shell to a lower shell and once it has happened that particular energy can be acquired by a second electron which basically am, leaves the particular sample surface as oj electron so instead of uh, going out as a photon with certain uh, with certain x ray uh, x ray photon that energy can be absorbed by a secondary electron which is in a little higher shell and then it can have acquire certain energy as well and that is called a oj electron to provide a picture skew explanation of this one how the particular uh, things really work out um, but before that uh, it just makes that oj and the x ray they are more complementary in nature so whatever we have like we have uh, uh, some atomic number out here so we we write atomic number atomic number in this particular axis x axis and say we have yield of either x ray or oj so we'll realize that the lower atomic number the lower atomic number elements will have very high oj yield and it will droop down with atomic number so oj yield is typically very high for say up to 15 to 20 atomic number whereas x ray yield is complementary to it so it will start building up from here and then the total will always be 1 so x ray plus oj will yield a total yield of 1 so if say if this was 1 1.0 this one will be 0.0 and generally the oj yield is very high for lower atomic number elements so it is very high for lower atomic number low z elements whereas x ray yield is typically very high for higher atomic number and the oj oj yield is typically very very low for higher atomic number so this uh, oj electron spectroscopy is generally utilized for low atomic number elements since the yield is very high so the detection becomes very very easier so that is the overall uh, explanation of uh, overall uh, yield which is uh, which combines oj and x ray so this is what the 
overall chart tells you about that the OJ yield will drop down with, decre with increasing atomic number whereas X-ray yield will keep increasing for higher atomic number and we keep OJ limited to uh, like up to 50 in the KLL, I uh, will come to the transitions but it can be detected up to like 40 or 45 atomic number. We can have a considerable OJ yield and till there we can utilize the OJ electron spectroscopy because after that X-ray yield is so high that it becomes much more easier to go with uh, X-ray and then it, gives, it might give a very high background for high, higher atomic number elements. And so OJ process how it is to be defined? Uh, it is defined by three basic steps. So as we say that we bombard the surface with very high energy, uh, high energy beam and that basically leaves, leads to atomic ionization. And atomic ionization means that we are removing an electron of from a core shell or K shell. So the first, first step is that an electron is removed from the K shell of the material and now the material or the sample is in higher energy state. So now that higher energy state has to go out either via X-ray fluorescence or via electron emission which leads to the OJ process. And third step is once the OJ electron has re released from the surface, it is a characteristic of a particular material and then we analyze that emitted OJ electron and that basically completes the process of OJ spectroscopy. So initially we have atomic ionization, relaxation by the emission of a OJ electrons and then detecting that particular OJ electron to get the overall composition of a material. So that basically completes the OJ process. And how exactly what is happening at the atomic level? Let us go to that particular part. First of all, the electronic structure uh, which is being defined, it will have certain uh, non-zero value of orbital and angular momentum. Like we have a principal quantum number, we have a, uh, angular quantum number and then we have certain shells like PED, F level shells and all these show spin orbit uh, splitting because we have uh, more than one electron in the P shell. So like in S we have plus, uh, plus spin and minus spin whereas in uh, P we have uh, uh, certain shells which, which, will, which lead to the splitting of the shell as we have uh, S and P orbitals. So like in 1S we have one level but once it goes to 2S and 2P, so 2S and 2P will show different energy levels because the overall structure of this S shell and P shell itself is different and so on. It can keep going on for once we have 3S, 3P. 3D and similarly for other uh, other levels, we can see certain splitting between these particular bands. Uh, so these all will lead to certain splitting in the electronic structure. Uh, let us not come to that right now, but again uh, once crossing that we have uh, a, a vacuum level, vacuum level and then we also can have valence band if required out here for some conducting materials. So the electron has to cross certain binding energy. That is that is what being defined where the electron is really placed either in 1s, 2s, 2p. So that is overall the electronic structure which is defined by the overall shells which the material has and the kind of valence uh, vacuum level where it has to overcome the barrier in terms of getting released from the surface. And so the OJ state can be defined like this. So we have uh, initial state, we have the intermediate state and then the final state. So intermediate state is more like that uh, initially we uh, take the material, we take the particular electron. So we have particular electron and then we are supplying certain energy with H mu. So we have uh, sh uh, electrons in the S shell, K shell or L shell and then higher shells. So we, uh, we have certain uh, particular materials. So because of this high energy photon, it basically will knock off an electron. So that electron in the K shell is basically knocked off. Now what will happen that the inter in the intermediate state we have we have one electron jumping from higher energy shell to a low energy shell. So basically what is happening is we had this K shell, L shell, M shell. So say an electron is jumping from M shell to K shell to, to basically take the position of a electron which was knocked off or the vacancy which was created out here. So we can 
so it can lower its energy. So we have some sort of a relaxation which is, which is occurred by the jumping of electron from higher shell to a lower shell. This is something called intermediate stage. But the final state will be more like this that the additional energy which is being released by the material, it is acquired by electron in a higher shell, it acquires the overall energy and then it basically leaves off as a OJ electron. So, in the first state, we had knockoff electron from K shell and in the second level, in the intermediate state, we had jumping of electron from higher shell, jumping of electron from higher shell to K shell or L shell, it, it can also be L shell, but coming to a core level, uh, core level shell and then the energy is being uh, absorbed by electron which is, in, uh, which is in the higher shell and that basically is the OJ electron which comes out with certain kinetic energy. And this kinetic energy is the typical uh, characteristic of a particular material. So, that is what we see that the in, in the initial stage we have a knocking of an electron from a core shell. And then in the intermediate state, we see an electron is jumping to the core shell and in the final state, we see the emission of a OJ electron. So, that is what is telling the OJ process and these things are classified as ionization, relaxation and OJ emission. So, we see that OJ process is again divided into three parts. So, coming back to the electronic structure of it, we can see that we have a vacuum level and then we have shells, we can call it L. 2, 3 for, L, for the p orbital, L 1 for the s orbital and then we have k shell which is nothing but the our 1s, uh, 1s orbital. So, we will have 2 electrons out here, 2 electrons out here and basically 6 electrons out here and then we will have a vacuum level. So, first process ionization, it is nothing but the removal of electron from k shell. So, we have our uh, vacuum level, it remains as such and then L 2 3, it, it will still have 6 electrons, L 1, it will have 2 electrons, but in K shell, we have 1 core or the one of the electrons has been knocked off. So, we say that this electron was knocked off because of the high incident energy, which is being incident on the particular material and the prime energy energies are in the range of 2 to 10 kV. Which, which are nothing but the ionization energy of any material. So, we see that once we are inserting certain energy or electron beam on a certain material, it is knocking off an electron from core level shell which is the K shell and it creates a vacancy or a core in the K shell. So, the first, the first uh, step in this particular OJ process is that we see that a core is created and then we, the other shells remains as such. So, L 1 and L 2 3 they remain as such and the only thing is we are creating a particular core hole in this first first step. And going to the second step of relaxation and OJ emission, we see that that one electron from a higher, a higher level jumps to fill an initial core. So, the same thing we see here that we had created a hole earlier. So, this was uh, our uh, vacuum level and then we had this L 2 shell, then we had L 1 shell, L 2 3 and L 1 and then we had a K shell. So, we, since we had a core, an electron can jump from higher shell to a lower shell or it means from L 1 or L 2 3, any one of uh, the electrons will jump to the lower energy shell. So, we see that one of the electrons is jumping out here from L 1 to K and then this release energy because uh, once the electron is jumping from a higher energy shell to a lower energy shell basically there will be some additional energy which will be available with the material and that particular extra energy is now being released. So, first step was ionization, in the second step we have jumping of electron from high energy shell to a low energy shell, therefore there is some gap or some difference in energy which is being released. So, that is what we are seeing, so we will have certain energy release and that will again lead to So, that, that can again uh, go back uh, that we now our K shell is already filled and L 1 and L 2 3. If the electron had jumped from L 1 
So, we had only 2 electrons out here. So, now we will have only 1 electron out here and then we will have certain say couple of 6 electrons. But now that additional energy can be occupied by this particular electron, it can go out as a OJ electron while overcoming any binding energy. So, this OJ electron has to cross certain uh, energy barrier to be able to release to get released from the surface. So, we see the overall thing. Firstly, a material is getting ionized, K, K, K shell electron is getting released. Then there is a jumping of electrons from a higher energy shell like L shell. Say in this case, we had a jumping of uh, L1 electron to the K shell. So, that uh, now that will release certain energy and that particular energy is being absorbed by an electron in the L23 shell and that goes off as OJ electron while overcoming the binding energy barrier. So, this energy is basically being utilized for overcoming the binding energy of this second electron. So, this particular second electron is this particular case and this thing uh, basically it is coming out as an OJ electron and it will have certain kinetic energy as well because the overall energy is overcoming binding energy plus acquiring certain energy which is nothing but the kinetic energy of the released electron. So, we have this energy which was uh, which was attained by the jumping of electron from uh, L shell to K shell that energy is being uh, absorbed by an electron which overcomes which uh, that energy it, it is utilized in overcoming certain binding energy and rest of it becomes its kinetic energy. So, that is what is uh, nothing but the OJ electron with certain kinetic energy. So, so we have uh, this particular energy as a sum of the binding energy plus some kinetic energy. So, this tells the overall process what is the OJ electron spectroscopy. But uh, that uh, okay, we can come back to it that uh, we can make a rough estimate of the kinetic energy of the OJ electron from the binding energy of the various levels in, in which the electrons are involved. And uh, in this particular case, we can see that uh, we had uh, the energy which is being released is the difference between the energy levels of E k minus E L 1, because we had E L 1 uh, electron, L 1 electron had jumped to the k level electron. So, this is the overall energy which was being released and this energy is again absorbed by the L 2 3 in overcoming its binding energy. So, we see that kinetic energy is the is equal to E k minus E L 1 minus E L 2 3. Again, if we rearrange this particular equation as below and we make it kinetic energy of the electron or the OJ electron is E k minus E L 1 and minus E L 2 3 or in the bracket e L 1 plus L 2 3, if this becomes similar to E k minus E L 2 3 minus E L 1. It means, had the electron jumped from E L 2 3 and the E L 1 would have gone as the OJ electron, still the, the kinetic energy of the OJ electron would not have changed. It means that all the 3 electrons which are participating, the, the kinetic energy depends only on those 3 electrons. It does not matter whether the electron had jumped from L 1 or L 2 3. So, these 2 electrons become indifferentiable. And since the latter two terms can of the energy could be interchanged without any effect because the kinetic energy is remaining the same as we saw earlier, that kinetic energy is remains same whether it is E L 2 3 which is being subtracted first or E L 1 which is being subtracted first. So, the overall kinetic energy is just written as E k minus E L 1 plus E L 2. So, which tells that these two energy, uh, energy terms could be interchanged. So, which makes that it is actually impossible, impossible to say which electron fills the initial core level and which electron is ejected as a OJ electron. So, that is the beauty of this particular, uh, this particular process that one electron is jumping from higher energy shell to fill the core level shell and second electron is getting emitted as a OJ electron, but these two electrons are indistinguishable because the energy will matter only where the initial core level electron was there and we are the two electrons which have participated from a higher shell. So, overall these two electrons are indistinguishable. The two electrons which are participating which are one is jumping and which, is, which one is coming out they are basically indistinguishable and therefore, an OJ transition is characterized, characterized primarily by 
the location of the initial hole in this case it was the k level k shell and the location of final two holes one is via jumping one core is created by the jumping of electron from uh, l shell l1 to k shell and second one was emission of oj electron from the l23 shell so now we had core in l1 and l23 so this is the location of final two holes and this is the location of our initial hole so overall oj process will depend what was the location of the initial hole the k shell and what is the location of the final two holes which was either jumping l1 and l23 sorry this one this one will come out here the location of initial hole was k and the location of final two holes is l1 and l23 so that is what tells the that was that is all what governs the overall oj process so basically we can interchange whether the transition was occurring from l23 2k and then l1 had released as a oj electron or the or vice versa so these two uh, electrons are nothing but indistinguishable and the energy remains same the kinetic energy remains same whether the electron has jumped from l1 or l23 so that that is all what the overall uh, significance of this particular oj process and as we said earlier that uh, oj electron depends uh, on the atomic number and we also saw that the yield is much higher in uh, case of uh, lower atomic number just because the probability is very high in, uh, in that the k, k electron can go away or the electron can go away and the, there can be jumping from higher shell, higher energy shells um, to yield this particular process but for high atom, higher atomic number the x ray uh, takes the predominance and the overall oj level basically keeps going down and basically we see that the uh, there, there are certain oj peaks which are uh, which can come out uh, by when a incident beam is uh, applied on a material and there are stronger kll signals it means that the uh, location of three electrons is from k shell l shell and l shell and mnn signals are much stronger for higher atomic number it means the transitions are occurring by creating a hole in the m shell and then n shell and n shell are participating in the jumping of electron to uh, uh, to m shell and then release of oj electron from the n shell and generally typically we see that the uh, atom if atomic number Uh, is on, on on this particular side, on particular axis ka your uh, y axis then we see that this is atomic number and in this case we have say electron energy uh, energy which is being uh, acquired uh, electron energy which is being supplied to the material for creating the ionization we sh- will uh, see something like that okay the let, let, let this is the nothing but the atomic number in this case and we see that the kll transitions are occurring something like this LLM transitions will occur more like this, and MMN N transitions will occur more like this, something like this. So we will see that KLL transitions are very predominant for certain atomic number, and then we'll have LMM transitions for little higher atomic numbers, which are much more predominant, and then MNN. And this is so true why? Because if uh, this is up, up to maybe say 15 to 20 atomic number, we have more KLL transitions. why because till then we don't have a m shell and as soon as the m shell starts coming in it governs that uh, basically the lmm transitions become much more probable because it is very difficult for a particular uh, atom that if it if it has a m shell n shell higher higher order shells it is very difficult for a electron beam to penetrate through the material and knock off a k electron because it is again surrounded by a l shell m shell n shell so this becomes very very improbable so that is the reason this oj process is very dominant uh, for kll transitions in lower atomic numbers and lmm transitions for little higher atomic number uh, uh, higher atomic number uh, elements and then again mmn transitions they become very very prob- predominant for even higher atomic numbers so approximately up to around 50 lmm transitions are much more probable and again 80 90 uh, atomic number mnn transitions they are much more probable and so we can see that the this uh, detection limit or the kll transitions they are very stronger for the low atomic numbers there is up to 50 it is uh, medium uh, atomic numbers we have this lmm transition which are more probable and for higher atomic numbers we have basically mm and nn transitions which are much more probable and we require certain level of energy to basically ionize a particular material and uh, those uh, basically run uh, up to in uh, maybe up from maybe say a couple of kv so we have the initial incident beam from running from 2 to 10 kv to ionize the core shells so that is what uh, is required in terms of ionizing the material 
and leading to a generation of a core hole and so that the OGO process can really occur. And as we see in this particular process, we require at least three electrons, one uh, transition to cause ionization and two more electrons to cause a jump and release of OGO electrons. That is the reason we need minimum three electrons and hydrogen and helium cannot be de detected. So, the minimum uh, element which can be detected, detected is lithium. So, that is what the overall uh, dependence of this KLL transitions and above. So, the OGO spectrum looks more like this that we have, we have to supply certain electron beam which ranges from around 2 to 10 keV to ionize a particular material and then, but these peaks are basically uh, they generate, they are on a very high background. Why? Because it, it is, uh, it also undergoes a multitude of inelastic scattering processes during the OJ uh, spec, uh, uh, while achieving the OJ spectrum. So, we have certain signal and the KE which is being detected uh, from the particular, from a particular detector. So, we have signal and again it has very high background and certain peaks for certain material and then it goes off. So, the overall background is very high for particular signal in, in the OJ process. So, uh, basically th that is not really good for detecting and it is not good for uh, achieving a particular repeatability. So, that is the reason this particular signal is differentiated with respect to the kinetic energy of a material and then basically we can achieve one more spectrum which is much more repeatable. So, we have something d n with respect to d e and then we have this particular uh, in terms of k e and electron volts and then we see that we achieve a very nice background with peaks, with very sharp peaks and very repeatable peaks. So, let me draw it again. So, we have this particular peak and then we achieve certain peaks and then it goes on. So, the, this is nothing but a kind of a zero background and we achieve certain peaks which are highly repeatable. So, it is actually possible to measure spectra directly in this particular form and it gives very good sensitivity because now these peaks are more repeatable and it, they are also very sensitive to particular materials. So, it is again reproducible for, for a particular referencing if you want to reference it. So, this was peak for say silver and then the difference, differentiated form will also give out this particular peak again at the same location and it would not be much with the background, it would not be more hazy like we saw in the earlier case, the peaks were more hazy and they were not really very sharp. So, that is the advantage of utilizing a differentiated form which is d n by d e, the number of counts with respect to the kinetic energy because it also considers a, 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 a way of taking the probability which was, which was not so uh, being defined in the earlier case. In this case, we know a particular uh, transition will occur, uh, occur at a certain energy level. So, that differentiation with respect to energy makes it very sensitive and reproducible. So, that is the advantage of using a differentiated peak. Also, the sensitivity is gone high because this particular ratio with respect to background, it also increases. So, that is the uh, advantage of util utilizing a differentiated form of AES that we have much more higher peak or better peak. And again, uh, it can be utilized for uh, detecting very small concentrations like we had certain spectra, uh, something like this, uh, it can be uh, certain spectra like this in the differentiated form. Uh, we can see that there is certain peaks which will correspond to similar same elements because we have transitions from KLL, LMM and MNN. So, we can see that the, the higher energy, uh, the higher atomic number uh, materials, they can have multitude of peaks. So, we can see certain peaks which can say belong to uh, say chromium, then again chromium or they can also have uh, more uh, peaks say, say, say something from nickel or nickel or it can also be that like in case of uh, certain materials like in steel, we have very small, uh, very fine uh, contributions from sulphur, phosphorus uh, elements like that which are very, which have very low concentration less than say 0 0.03 weight percent. Still, we can see that this um, OGS spectra can detect even that. So, even such a lower concentration can be uh, defined by say sulphur or say some peaks in phosphorus. So, those peaks can also be detected very easily in uh, in the OGS spectra. So, we had this uh, end in terms of energy and it can be again uh, differentiated with respect to energy and this is again the energy. So, we can uh, detect always some peaks which are, uh, which were really not probable with concentrations of less than 0 0.03 weight percent. We are seeing that OGS spectra can detect uh, the major peaks which can come out either say from uh, major peaks can be either from chromium or say nickel or even iron because uh, for a stainless steel the major composition will be say iron uh, and then chromium will be say around uh, 
25, maybe say 15 to 25 percent. The nickel can also be from 12 to say 15, 20 percent. So that those are the major peaks for what you what we might expect to see in the OJ spectra. And then again, sulfur and phosphorus very low in quantity, but those will also be detected if you utilize the OJ spectra. So that is the beauty of uh, this particular process that even uh, elements with very small concentrations, less than 0 0.03 weight percent, can also be detected in the OJ process. And in this particular processing, we require very ultra high vacuum, to the order of 10 to the minus 9 tor. Why? Because the OJ electrons, they are very low energy electrons and once they have to leave the surface and get detected at the detector, so they need to go undergo uh, the detection process without collision with the atmosphere. If, you, if it is colliding with the atmosphere uh, atoms, then it is basically losing the energy and that will increase the background. So this particular vacuum level will create a mean free path which is approximately 40 kilometer and as we said earlier that the OJ effects are much dominant for atomic number less than 15 and for uh, Allen M shell uh, transitions it can be measured up to atomic number of up to 50. So that is the overall thing which we saw earlier uh, because of the presence of the different shells and this is the very much requirement that it requires an ultra high vacuum of order of 10 to the power minus 9 tor. And coming to the components of a, a OJ electron spectroscopy, basically we require an electron source which will have a variable energy because we want to see what is the overall kinetic energy and how it is dependent on the ionization because we are applying certain energy and it is uh, basically knocking off an K shell electron. So we want to see how the transitions are occurring and uh, again this particular variable source of energy is also uh, useful in terms of describing a very fine spot of electrons. So we should have an electron source which should have a variable energy source and then this electron has to go through a electron energy analyzer and there are different types of analyzer which can be a spherical sector or hemispherical sector and then it has to basically pass through an electron detector. So electron energy analyzer will separate out of the energies and then those energies once it is filtered it will basically get at electron detector where it can basically be detected that oh this is an electron and then that uh, the intensity of that particular detection will be counted. At the same time the uh, measurements have to be done in the ultra high vacuum. Uh, just because that the OJ electrons which can travel from surface to the detector without any collision and secondly the surface cleaning is also one of the very critical uh, features out here that once as soon as we take the sample from a uh, particular location to the OJ, uh, OJ chamber then it can get contaminated depending on its reactivity. So we want to keep the sample clean and so to, uh, to avoid the particular contamination we want to use a ultra high vacuum which is to the order of 10 to, 10 to the power minus 9 tor and there are certain other options uh, which can be available with uh, OG electron spectroscopy is something called ion source. Ion source can be utilized for cleaning the surface prior to the analysis. So if you want to measure a very clean surface, say if you take a sample it gets oxidized, we want to clean the surface to see what is the actual surface and so that we can measure its concentration depth profile and then we can measure it. So that is, uh, that is an accessory to the OG electron spectroscopy and coming to the analyzer part. Uh, there are certain analyzers, uh, one is uh, one of them is cylindrical mirror an analyzer. It has basically some concentric uh, electrodes and then those electrodes are uh, basically on, uh, it is, up, it is, up, it is uh, we apply certain bias to it and then it can allow only certain energy levels to pass through it. If it is higher energy, it will be absorbed by one of the electrodes, lower energy then it will be absorbed by another uh, electrode and that those two electrodes are again earths. So basically, uh, certain energy gap can only traverse through a particular concentric uh, electrode setup. So uh, cylindrical mirror setup, so that basically determines the pass energy and then it allows only a certain or a narrow range of kinetic energy to pass through it and uh, basically the similar system also uh, can be uh, utilized by using a hemispherical analyzer. So, uh, so how the particular analyzer looks like, uh, okay let us go back to it and let us see how the cylindrical mirror analyzer looks like. So we have this particular electron energy uh, source which goes and bombards a particular sample surface and then we have the electrodes, electrodes like this and then only a certain level of energy uh, the OG electrons will pass through this particular uh, electrode set of electrodes and it will reach the detector. 
if it basically coincides with one of the electrodes, this electrode or this electrode, the energy level, all the electron will get absorbed onto the electrodes. So, the, so only the bias on these two electrodes will basically decide how much, how much the particular uh, energy is allowed through the particular analyzer. So, we have uh, electron, electron energy source which interacts with the sample and then we have the original electrons which are emitted and they pass through the analyzer and only a certain energy is basically allowed to pass through and to reach the detector. And that is how this particular cylindrical mirror analyzer really works. And uh, this was a one pass filter, we can also have two pass filter where we can uh, see more like this that electron gun it is uh, interacting with the material and then basically it is uh, coming out at a certain uh, certain energy is coming out and to verify that the, that this is again the same energy level we can have one more set of electrodes out here again these electrodes will make a second pass so this is first pass and then again you have certain uh, kind of opening and then you again have these two electrodes which will again decide the overall energy and then it will have a detector so this is nothing but the second pass. So we had this uh, particular electron gun, it is interacting with the sample out here and then we have OG electrons which pass through the first detect the first uh, first pass and then this becomes the second pass and then we have again electrons going out from through the analyzer like this. So we have again the detector out here and which detects the overall intensity of electrons through this particular process. And now comes the important part, once it has passed through the detection, uh, passed through the analyzer, now we have to detect what is the overall count of the OG electrons. So basically we have, uh, we have to focus the electrons which are, which, which were uh, basically uh, coming out. So basically we have focused electrons are incident on a sample and then they are passed through the cylindrical mirror analyzer for the analysis part and then we have its detection where the, they are multiplied and signal is sent to the data processing. So, we have photomultiplier tubes or the dianodes which basically take the detect the electron and multiply it. So, again we can have single channel uh, detector or multi channel detector depending on it can be a continuous dianode surface or a photomultiplier tube and then the collected elect, uh, OG electrons are basically captured and then they are plotted as a function of energy against the broad secondary electron background spectrum. So, since it has a very huge background, then again it can be again later on differentiated to achieve a very nice repeatable sensitive OJ spectrum which is dn by dE with respect to the energy and that is what we have. We have first its analysis and then the detection part comes through the multi channel or the single channel detector other by photo multi, uh, multiplier tube or through continuous dianode surfaces. And one more thing to mention is that the energy of OJ electrons is in between that of a secondary electron and a backsided electron. And again once we have uh, detected it, we can have the quantitative measurement of a OJ composition that the, over, the atomic concentration of an element can be given by, uh, by this particular equation where x is the intensity of the unknown specimen. So, x is the intensity coming out from an unknown specimen and i is the pure element. So, i is the uh, pure element and x is the unknown specimen and then we have uh, I, the, I is the intensity of the OJ signal and S is coming out from the relative in, is the relative intensity. So, by comparing in this particular manner, we can see what is the overall signal which is coming out from the sample and the, what is the overall signal which is coming out from the standard sample. So, by comparing those two, we can say what is the overall concentration of X in particular sample. So, we need to have pure samples available to be able to say what is the overall concentration of that particular material in the unknown sample. And again it can be utilized for OJ depth profiling and it can uh, detect what is beneath the surface uh, or the buried layer, what is the overall, what, are, what are the overall uh, compositions which are uh, basically can be attained out here. So, basically we have a surface and it is being bombarded by an ion source. So, it basically starts eating the surface and now we have some surface which is beneath the original uh, layer. So, the OJ process it can detect its composition from uh, step 1 and it can also detect composition after it has the sample has been etched. 
So, this can particularly provide what is the composition at level 1 and what is the composition level at level 2. And while this particular ion beam is etching the surface, it is necessary to know what is the etching time. Because depending on the material, depending on the energy of the uh, ion beam, the way it will eat out the material will be very different. One material will be eaten away quicker, second material may, can be eaten away a little slower. Also depending on the uh, current or the, or the ion beam uh, intensity, again the etching level will be little different. So, but then the OJ signals which are coming out, coming out from the surface, they can be correlated with the overall depth of a particular material and uh, it can provide us information of what is the particular material concentration with respect to depth. So, this depth or the etching time can be correlated here with respect to percent composition out here. So, coming to just one example, so say if we had a particular material and say we saw some peaks out here and then it is dying out like this. It means this particular material was sensitive only on the surface for say certain of certain nanometer regime. So, it was 2 or 3 nanometer in terms of depth, in terms of percent composition. So, this particular material and then we can also see something some more is some something more is forming on the surface. So, this was oxygen and say this one was silicon. So, we can say there is some formation of silicon oxide on the surface. So, we can uh, say that probably oxygen level will go down and then we can say that there was some uh, some higher concentration of a material say it was silicon and then again oxygen. We can say silicon oxide was basically predominant at this particular on the surface whereas, say the, surf, the, the bulk was say something like this. So, silicon and then oxygen and then say we have we had something like indium. So, we can say the bulk of it is formed of indium whereas, it was probably coated with some silicon and which is formed a oxide. So, we can say that SiO2 is forming on an indium bulk. So, that is how it will tell that what is the overall uh, material, what is the overall material which is basically being uh, what, what is really happening on the surface and how this depth profiling can help us identify what is happening beneath the surface. So, via ion etching we can uh, via this particular process we can see that the, with the increasing depth we are seeing increasing concentration of indium and decreasing concentration of silicon and oxygen. So, it means that there was some silicon oxide which might have formed on the surface. One more th dimension can be given to it is that it can also happen that we had silicon and then it was going like this and then we had some oxygen and then it drops much earlier to that. So, it means that, that silicon oxide is forming only to a certain thickness and there is again some more regime where silicon is still intact. So, we have formation of some silicon oxide on the surface, beneath that we have some silicon and then we have some indium on which the particular silicon might have been coated. So, that tells the overall depth profile of a particular OJ process. So, now coming back to the overall features of the OJ electron spectroscopy to, to summarize uh, the overall lecture that we have uh, characteristic energy losses, they can occur because of plasma losses or which, are, which can be again channeled through in the electron photo electron spectroscopy. So, they basically create the background and then there can be a charging of insulating samples. Uh, so, by choosing a proper incidence angle and by choosing proper beam energy, we can take care of that by lowering the beam energy and by inclining the surface. And then OG electron spectroscopy can also be utilized for qualitative and quantitative spectroscopy. It can also be used for the depth profiling part. And basically in this OG electron spectroscopy, we realize that we have uh, basically OG process arising from three electrons. One is the a uh, core level electron which, which is basically knocked off. Then we have one electron jumping from higher energy shell to a lower energy shell. And then third thing that energy is absorbed by an electron which basically is emitted via overcoming the binding energy that is called a OJ electron. And we saw that how the overall uh, instrumentation is also done that we have a uh, or, or incident electron beam energy source and then we have certain something called analyzer that basically allows only a certain energy levels to pass through it and that allows only certain uh, electrons to come out with certain energy levels and that is being detected by a detector where some dynodes or uh, photomultiplier tubes and that thing is again plotted as curve with respect to energy. So, we have signal count with respect to energy and to make it much more precise, we take a differentiated form in, uh, in with respect to dn by dE with respect to energy and that is much more sensitive and much more repeatable and then we also saw that the OJ electron spectroscopy can also be utilized for depth profiling via uh, damage by, via 
doing the surface by uh, applying certain ion beam and then etching out the surface and then seeing what is happening beneath the surface to comment on what is the overall composition of the overall sample which, uh, which was under consideration and it can also tell you what is happening beneath the surface and so on. So basically we end our lecture here, thanks a lot.